the first time I met George was at his bar at the Spiffy Dapper along Boat Key. And um, you know, the, he runs a bar that like says like no other. You either hate it or you love it, you know. <laughs> but I have to say the drinks are good, so go try it. They're, they're now in Amoy Street and the bar, the bar is bigger now, so you can have more people in it, so that's good. But if you look at um, the Spiffy, da Spiffy Dapper's Facebook page, it's quite hilarious, it's quite entertaining to read. Did you write all that stuff? Yeah. Yeah. So, it's <laughs> so when I asked George to come speak at Fuck Up Nights, the first question he asked, can I swear? And I'm like, it's called Fuck Up Nights, you know? And yeah, we do a reasonable amount of swearing here. But uh, you've been warned. That was control right there, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I won't waste your time. I'll let you take the floor. You want to click up? Yeah. Okay. Hey. Yeah. Hello. Ooh. I sound nice. <laughs> so, um, great. Um, so, like uh, Emily said, the first question I had was, uh, "Can I swear?" and uh, I was thinking I'm going to swear a lot, but then Calvin came with his kids. But then I checked with Calvin if I can swear, but he said, okay, so I'm going to swear anyways. <laughs> um, we, do I point this out? <coughs> right. That didn't work? Ah, right, wrong button. All right, cool. So I'm a, I'm a serial fuck-up. Um, there is uh, pretty much everything I have touched, I have completely fucked. Uh, without, uh, yeah, pretty much. So uh, I'm just going to go through some of the stuff, the major ones I fucked up, and just maybe share with some stuff I learned. Uh, because when she asked me to do it, I made a list of all the things I fucked up. I was like, there's no fucking way I'm going to cover this in the amount of time given. Um, so yeah, um, first fuck up, student life. So my mother sent me to Singapore um, when I was 16 years old, uh, put me on a plane, gave me a semester of school fees, a semester of accommodation, and asked me to kindly fuck off. Um, she didn't say that. You should probably cut that in the video, unless my mother see it. <laughs> um, anyway, so I came here, and for the first semester, like every good Indian boy, I studied. Uh, but in the second semester, I discovered three things. Uh, number one was beer, number two was smoking, and number three was women. The last part was especially surprising. Um, so I spent the second semester pretty much, you know, drinking and smoking all the time. And when the exams came, uh, on the day of the exam, my friend told me, hey, we got an exam today. I said, I didn't study, so I'm not going to go. So I repeated the semester. Only later did I realize in Singapore, unlike in India, a week before your final exams for the semester, there's a makeup session where the lecturers basically give you 90% of the answers you need to pass the exam. And that was a strange fucking phenomenon for me. Because in India, you don't study for at least a month before your exam, you're completely fucked. So I was like, what the fuck, Singapore? What? This is a completely horrible way to do education. Um, <laughs> then my friend told me, and I, at this point in time, I was somebody who could remember a lot of things. I was, you know, but I, couldn't, I didn't really know what to do with the things I knew. So he told me, don't worry about knowing things. Figure out how to find things. And that was uh, one of the biggest experiences, learning things that uh, Singapore educational system gave to me, if nothing else. Um, so that was the first lesson. You don't need to know. You need to know where to find the information. The second fuck up uh, during that time was um, I was working as a waiter. I was working my way through school. And I don't know if you guys remember, there was the SARS epidemic. And I was working at a restaurant in Clark Key. And during this time, the restaurant was going through bad times and I didn't have a job. Uh, so I couldn't pay my rent, and I had to live for about a, a month on the streets. And it was a funny thing, because before then I had a computer and a bicycle and you know all kinds of gizmos that a teenage boy needs. And all of a sudden, I'm out on the streets, I'm um, <coughs> living out of parks. I had, in that time, in Tuesday, I had one dollar loaves of bread. I had a Nutella, and Nariscus um, stewed pork by the tin was my luxury for the week. Um, so that was, that was a weird time. but. Looking back, I realized that was probably some of the happiest times of my life. That is when I realized that I do not need things to be happy. I need me. I need presence of mind. I need the ability to be alive. And that really changed my uh, life philosophy going forward. And now um, my woman always tells me that I always choose the most boring things. She does not allow me to choose my bed sheets because, you know, it's always boring. But then again, the reason for all that was 
you know, I now like minimalism as opposed to maximalism, some shit like that. <laughs> First job. So eventually I graduated and um, I started applying for jobs, but I didn't get the jobs because I was applying for CEO positions and for some reason they didn't feel I was qualified. <laughs> so um, I got a job as an apprentice bartender in a bar that was about to open. Two days before we opened, the guy who's supposed to set up the bar fucks off. And the boss is like, George, can you set up a bar? I'm like, fuck yeah. So I used the first lesson, which is know where to find stuff. And I Googled, how do you set up a bar? I made a list of all the things and I set up the fucking bar. Uh, the first day was funny because I didn't know how to do a, you know, open a keg. So I tried stabbing you with a knife. That was, <laughs> that was weird. Um, anyways, my boss was not ready to see that day. And um, I spent the next one and a half years working my ass off. I, I really... For the next one and a half years, I didn't take a single day off. I didn't take a sick leave, like, end of which I blacked out, and I left the company. But during this time, I had become a shareholder and a director of the company, and I thought that was a great thing, and I was given that because I'm a great fucking employee. Ha. But that was not the case. So after I leave the company, the owner of the company fucks off to another country, is, and he does not do compliance. He didn't pay suppliers, blah, blah, blah. And fuck. <laughs> Right? So there's a couple of companies, and I spent pretty much the next one and a half years thinking I was going to go to prison, my life is fucked, I, I was just doing all kinds of stupid things. But then I realized um, I have to take control of my life, and I tried to do it, and I looked at the problem and I tried to solve it. I started by learning the company law, started doing the accounts myself, and I got out of the situation about three years later. And the two important lessons I got from there is this. Trust people and make sure you hold a fucking rock in the other hand. <laughs> the second thing is, problems are never as hard as they look. I, I always thought the problems were horrible, like it's just going to end me. But it's your, if you just get up, look up, look at the first problem, chip away at it. And it's going to be like fucking horrendously, like ridiculously, stupidly slow. But if you get it, eventually you'll be able to get over the issues that you're facing. Ah, brilliant. So, fast forward, I had a lot of sh shit in between. Uh, anyways, then I managed to hustle a bar. It was actually a hustle because I didn't have any money. A friend of mine told me that there's somebody who has a space. So I went and, told, and got this guy to talk me up. Then I talked to him like, I'm doing him a fucking favor, and I'm, asked, I'm basically opened a bar. We didn't have licenses or a lease or anything like that. And after about one year of operating, I realized that, hey, I have to make this shit legit. So I found a place in Little India, I signed the lease, and two days later, the fucking riot happens. I'm like fucking Indians. <laughs> My fucking countrymen, you could have either done the riot two fucking days ago, or could have not rioted at all. <laughs> Anyways, there goes the plan of the bar, because, you know, URA and Singapore Police Force do not want to touch anything. I try to make it a cafe, they say no way. So eventually, I decided to build a co-working space. <laughs> so I bought the wood. <laughs> And I basically spent six months building with wood, and I built a fucking co-working space. <laughs> By this time, I ran out of money, and I had to take care of the other business, which I was not looking after. So I didn't get any time to sell that one. So, you know, my co-working space is now the place where I stay. <laughs> <laughs> Lost a fuck ton of money there. The lesson I learned from this was this. Sometimes it is just luck. There's nothing you can fucking do about it. I just, just completely out of your fucking control. Well, the important thing is this. Sometimes when shit like that hits you, there is really no, you know, best way or wrong way to go about it. Because I took money from people to build it. And thinking back, I would owe a lot of people a lot less money if I stopped and just cut that away right now. And I owe people a fuck ton of money now. But, uh, <laughs> but now, as my businesses have grown, it's now grown as a, it's now a space for my employees to come together. It's now my office. So there's really no way of... Uh, as uh, Steve Jobs said, right, like connecting the dogs backwards or some shit like that. That's basically what happens. Uh, yep. <clears throat> ah. So, going to be fast with this one because I filled a fair bit of restaurants. One, two, three, four. Right, about eight or nine I have uh, fucked up um, doing this business. Um, and two super simple things I've learned is... Um, Number one, either have complete fucking creative control. 
And that is so important because a lot of the times when we go into businesses and stuff, you're thinking like, hey, this person's great and all that shit. But um, one thing that people do not think about is rate of growth. A lot of the times you might be working with somebody who is at the same level as you when you start. But if you're growing at different rates, uh, soon one or the other person will outgrow each other. And when that happens, it's not, it's not a nice picture at all. So either have complete trust, make sure that the person's growing at the same rate, invest in that person as well as you're investing in yourself, or make sure you have complete fucking control. And make sure you raise more money than you'll ever need because you never know what's gonna come at you. Yeah. Ah, yeah, this is my favorite one. Um, now, I fucked up so much as a human being, and um, I'm not saying like, you know, it's horrible to people. I am usually horrible to people. But mostly, I always try to fit in. Looking back, um, I think about trying to fit in was, I don't know, well, new in this fucking country and all that shit, whatever. But as I have done so many things and I have fucked up so many times, I realize the whole point is stop trying to be cool about things. Stop, just fucking be yourself. You know, most people will definitely hate you. And if they fucking hate you for it, so be it. Good riddance, fuck off. <laughs> and screw weaknesses, work on your strengths. A lot of us think too much about the things that we're fucking up. Really, it does not do any fucking favors to anybody. Nobody wants to be with people who are complaining all the time, think talking about the weaknesses all the time, fuck that shit. People want to be around with happy people who are doing shit. So do stuff, work on your strengths, fuck your weaknesses. You can work on that when you're fucking old like Helen. <laughs> um, ah, thank you. <laughs> uh, questions? Anyone? Uh, I have Did you ever think that things went really bad? Mm. Uh, instead of looking at the problem, have you ever come to you, why did I start this in the first place? And how, what did you say to yourself when you thought that way? Um, Funny question. Um, well, I knew what I, why I was doing it. I kind of hacked my brain at 23 and I figured out what the fuck I was supposed to do. So everything from then was trying to figure out how to get it done. I'm trying, still trying to figure it out. I did not understand that at all. Food and beverage, was that from the beginning of the year that that's the area or? It was desperation. <laughs> School fees mostly. <laughs> um, after that, it was, well, hey, I got a bar. <laughs> like, I. Like two weeks before I opened the bar, I did not know that I was going to have a bar. Then I had a bar. I was like, fuck yeah. Um, and I realized I did not think the damn thing was going to last. So I was like, fuck this shit. We're going to make it fun as long as it lasts. Um, so then I basically did all the things that a bar owner shouldn't do. And for some reason, it became successful. And then I was like, OK, maybe I should quit everything else and do this. So that's how I got there. I just wonder, is it very easy to steal um, business ideas? Because I think the previous speakers also mentioned about having a high-end. So I think mean, that would kind of be business of thing. It is something that you need to constantly worry about as a company. I share everything. Um, sorry? Repeat the question. All right. So, so the question was, do I share ideas easily? Uh, are my worried about people stealing stuff? Um, I used to be. Uh, but then I realized, Ideas are easy, execution's hard. Uh, there's, you know, a lot of people who's gonna take this thing, especially in my business, bar business, fucking hard. But pretty much everything else as well, right? Um, everybody can say, hey, this is a cool fucking idea, like, but when you look at it, even if you're looking at tech, right? Uh, your architecture, your team, your UX, you know, it's the difference between the best UX guy, bad UX guy is activations on your app, simple as that. So fuck ideas, work on execution. Yeah. Most scared you ever been? Ah, funny one. Um, 
did my first round of fundraising to make, okay, so I fucked up the co-working space, so I had to go back and raise money again, because, you know, we still didn't have a lease. So I went to raise money, then I saw this restaurant, we, we invested in it, we fucked that up. Then my board decided to kick me out, so I had to do a coup d'etat, kick the board out. And then I had seven days to raise $150,000 to get a new place. I shit my pants. <laughs> I did it, but yeah. Do you uh, regret any of your fuck ups? Absolutely not. Or when you should have created control, or when you should trust someone. If they're under my foot, I trust them. <laughs> yeah, that was a joke. Um, <laughs> you you want to work with people for a while, and uh, what I do is I always hire, in my industry especially, um, I hire people who have no experience, I build them up and go from there. Uh, there's, once you work with somebody for a while, um, so I work with progressive equity, then I kind of set them free, virgin style, some shit like that. So that way you know like who you're working with, as opposed to just like, everybody can come and tell you, oh, I did this, I did this, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I think the key thing is, um, you know, just don't give shit away straight out. Give stuff away progressively. So if you're working with somebody that's new, say, hey, great. I have the fucking idea. I'm bringing you in. I get it. I'm going to give you, let's say, 1% equity every quarter. Okay, cool. And then if they fuck up, they take the equity, they walk away, but at least we still have a fucking company and all that stuff. So that's really how you can protect yourself. There's no other way. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. <laughs>